love the nation. Hana Hayao Le Ahudo. That my land. Ina Natu Mashiha Bara de Haleha. Anea Na. Good fuck! Mashlam. Isaiah chapter 53, this is what we read about Jesus. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds, we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. We're gathered here this morning to remember the sacrifice of Jesus. Should you stand and sing of this man of sorrows? my 
my salvation where your love poured out over me now my soul cries out hallelujah praise and honor unto thee sands of heaven god's own son to purchase and Time. 
the blood of Jesus. This is all my righteousness, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me Welcome you this morning to our Good Friday service. One of my favorite definitions of prayer is that prayer is only for the helpless. Prayer, old Halsby, a Norwegian pastor, writes, simply consists in telling God day by day in what ways we feel that we are helpless. And if you think about it, the Christian life begins with a cry of helplessness. That's what today reminds us of, is that we were helpless to save ourselves. We needed a Savior. But we don't graduate from this feeling of helplessness. And old Halsby, he continues and he says, We realize in prayer how impotent we are by nature to believe to love, to hope, to serve, to sacrifice, to suffer, to read the Bible, to pray, and to struggle against our sinful desires. Every time we pray, we are asking for divine help, help from outside of ourselves. And in just a moment, I'm going to lead us in a corporate prayer. And I would encourage you to pray along but I want us to pray out of that place of helplessness because I believe it's one that many of us can, are feeling even today. So, many of our, our, so much of our lives, is, we feel as though we are trying to climb up this ladder and we get to the top and we realize that it's led us nowhere. Do you ever feel that way? You're just climbing one rung after the other and you never reach the top. And in this prayer this morning, we're asking that the Lord would have mercy on us, that he would come to deliver us. And the amazing thing is, in praying this, we believe that God answers that prayer. Out of that place of helplessness, he brings help for us. And Jesus has this wonderful encouragement for us, these wonderful words. Jesus is a, is a perfect master, and he tells his disciples, and he gives us this invitation Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Jesus wants to give you rest in your helplessness. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is is light. Jesus compares his, he talks about a yoke, that thing that is placed over the animal, and he says, he bears the load. His yoke is easy. His burden is light. And in praying this prayer today, it's, it doesn't diminish our, ourselves in acknowledging that we need help. And so I encourage you to follow along with me. We're going to have this, the words come up on the screen. I'll read the first part and then the bolded part on the bottom of each is kind of what we're going to read together. 
And so I encourage you to follow along. O God, the Father, creator of heaven and earth, have mercy upon us. O God, the Son, redeemer of the world, O God, the Holy Spirit, sanctifier of the faithful. O holy, blessed, and glorious Trinity, one God. Remember not, Lord Jesus, our offenses, neither reward us according to our sins. Spare us, gracious Lord, spare your people, whom you have redeemed with your most precious blood, and by your mercy, preserve us forever. From all evil and wickedness, from sin, from the works and the and assaults of the devil, from your wrath and everlasting condemnation. From all blindness of heart, from pride, vanity, and hypocrisy, from envy, hatred, and malice, and from all lack of charity. From all disordered and sinful affections, and from all the deceits of the world, the flesh, and the devil. From all false doctrine, heresy, and division, from hardness of heart and contempt of your word and commandments. From lightning and tempest, from earthquake, fire, and flood, from plague, pestilence, and famine. From all oppression, conspiracy, and rebellion, from violence, battle, and murder, and from dying suddenly and unprepared. By your agony, by your cross and passion, by your precious death and burial, by your glorious resurrection and ascension, by the sending of the Holy Spirit, by your heavenly intercession, and by your coming again in power and great glory. In all times of tribulation, in all times of prosperity, in the hour of death, and in the day of judgment. In this we pray, in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. When you are coming in today, you should have received a black card. If you did not receive a black card, uh, after the sermon, we're going to be uh, kind of uh, responding with these black cards. And Just raise your hand and someone will bring you one of those black cards. Um, if you did not receive one, does anyone not receive one of those cards? Looks like we did a good job here. Okay. Well, if you have your Bibles with you, we're going to turn to Matthew 27 this morning. Matthew 27. And our text today comes from verse 11. Matthew 27, beginning in verse 11. Meanwhile, Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? You have said so, Jesus replied. When he was accused by the chief priests and the elders, he gave no answer. Then Pilate asked him, Don't you hear the testimony they are bringing against you? But Jesus made no reply, not even to a single charge, to the great amazement of the governor. Now it was the governor's custom at the festival to release a prisoner chosen by the crowd. At that time, they had a well-known prisoner whose name was Jesus Barabbas. So when the crowd had gathered, Pilate asked them, Which one do you want me to release to you, Jesus Barabbas or Jesus who is called the Messiah? For he knew it was out of self-interest that they had handed Jesus over to him. While Pilate was sitting on the judge's seat, his wife sent him this message. Don't have anything to do with that innocent man, for I have suffered a great deal today in a dream because of him. But the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and to have Jesus executed. Which of the two do you want me to release to you? asked the governor. Barabbas, they answered. What shall I do then with Jesus who is called the Messiah? Pilate asked. They all answered, crucify him. Why? What crime has he committed? asked Pilate. But they shouted all the louder, crucify him. When Pilate saw that he was getting nowhere, but that instead an uproar was starting, he took water, 
and washed his hands in front of the crowd. I am innocent of this man's blood, he said. It is your responsibility. All the children answered, his blood is on us and on our children. Then he released Barabbas to them, but he had Jesus flogged and handed him over to be crucified. And this is the word of the Lord. Barabbas was guilty. He was a well-known prisoner. He was notorious for his criminal activity. Each of the four Gospels speak of him. He was a rebel, a robber, a murderer. He participated in a violent rebellion and his deeds deserved death, and yet... He was set free. He was a condemned man. The cross was awaiting him, and remarkably, in this, in a, in the remarkable turn of events, he was set free. Now, let me ask you this: Do you think the Barabbas should have been released? Do you believe that he should have been free to go? He, he was a rebel, a murderer, he deserved death, and yet he was given life. Is there not, like, part of you that's screaming out inside saying, that's not just? There needs to be justice. Do you believe that a guilty person should be set free? Or should everyone have to pay for the wrong that they have done. Now let me ask it to you this way. If you were the guilty one, would you want to be set free? Or would you be willing to accept the punishment you deserve? Have you ever noticed this about yourself? When someone else is in the wrong, you want justice. But when you're the one that's in the wrong, you want mercy. You know, most people, I'd say, do not demand the full weight of the law to be brought down on them when they have committed an offense. You know, have you ever been pulled over for speeding and the officer asked you, do you know how fast you were going? And you said, yes, I was doing 70 in a 40 zone. Whatever the right and fair punishment is, I'm willing to accept it. I welcome it because I was in the wrong. How about this? Have you ever been at work or, or even school and a coworker makes a mistake, and you go on and on, usually behind their back, but you go on and on about how incompetent they have been. You know, you, you feel that you need to punish them for what they have done. And then inevitably you make a mistake, but you're never quite as hard on yourself as you are your coworker. Instead, you try to justify what you've done, you know, okay, the sun was in my eyes, that's why. Or it wasn't as bad, you know, it, you could try to sweep it under the carpet. It's not as bad as you really think. Now, do you ever think this? When you make a mistake, your, your coworker is probably going on and on about you, about how incompetent you have been. I think it's fair to say that for all of us is quite common, that we, we want justice when someone else is in the wrong, but we really want mercy when we're the one in the wrong. So let me ask you again, kind of while thinking about yourself, do you believe that a guilty person should be set free? Barabbas was guilty, he was a rebel, 
and his deeds deserve death. And the Bible teaches us we are all like Barabbas. We're all guilty, for, for all have sinned. We're all rebels. We, we all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us have turned to our own way. And, for our, and our deeds, they deserve death, for the wages of sin is death. Just like Barabbas, we stand condemned before God. You might say, but Barabbas was a murderer. You know, I've, I've never killed anyone. Pretty good person. You know what's interesting? The hate that drives someone to kill another human being is the same hate that drives someone to call another human being an idiot. Jesus said in Matthew 5, anyone who murders will be subject to judgment, which we can all appreciate. But he doesn't stop there. He says, but I tell you, anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Anyone who says, you fool, will be in danger of the fire of hell. Love does not drive a person to call another person stupid. Hatred does that. The same hate that drives someone to commit murder. We've all sinned. We're all guilty. There's no one amongst us who is perfect. Let's be honest. Myself included. No one is perfect. Whether we are guilty of hatred, jealousy, Gossiping, idolatry, sorcery, witchcraft, fits of rage, murder, selfish ambition, greed, stealing, lying, drunkenness, disobeying our parents, unbelief, adultery, lusting, or, or sexual morality. We're all guilty of sin before God. We have all rebelled and gone our own way. He never commanded us to do any of those things I just listed. And just to be clear, sexual morality can be biblically understood as taking part in any type of sexual relationship that is outside the bonds of marriage between a man and a woman. God created sex, but he created it for the marriage bed, and we are all to honor God's plan for human sexuality and keep the marriage bed pure. In Galatians 5, 21, Paul warns us and he says, those who live like this, listing many of the things that I just listed, he says, those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. Or in other words, those who do these wicked things are condemned to death and they will not see life. We're all guilty. We have all rebelled against God. He did not command hate. He commanded love. And our deeds deserve death. You see, each one of us, we received a black card. And I want to use this, this black card that's been handed out to everyone this morning just to help us understand how a guilty person can be set free. This card is to represent your sin, your guilt, your legal indebtedness, the legal debt you owe God for breaking the law. And all those who carry one of these cards is condemned. We're told in the Bible Jesus is going to come back one day. He is going to return and he's coming to judge the world. And unless your sin is taken away, you will not see life, but will be punished for your sin for all eternity in the fires of hell. I want everyone to hold up their card for a moment. Take it out, hold it up. And I just want you to look around the room. I want you to look around the room so we know we, we are all in the same boat. We're all sinners. You can put your cards down. Thank you. We're all like Barabbas. We stand condemned. 
His, his story is really like this live action parable that we can learn from. He was guilty, but he was set free from his guilt. And the question I want to answer this morning is this. How are the guilty set free? How are the guilty set free? For I wish no one to be carrying this card when they leave this world. I want each of one of us to be set free from sin and death and to be given God's gift of eternal life. You know, personally, I would hate to, to endure this life. It, it, let's face it, there's a lot of days we just endure. I, w- I would hate to endure this life and then at the end, not spend my eternity with God. That is a tragic life, and I wish it upon no one. So how are the guilty set free? What we learn from Barabbas' story is that it takes an innocent man to set a guilty man free. It takes an innocent man to set a guilty man free. The religious leaders Uh, of the Jews, they hated Jesus. They wanted to kill him, so the chief priests had him arrested, and he was brought before the whole Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin was the supreme court of the Jews. And they struggled to find any evidence against Jesus that would justify putting him to death. And they finally decided to charge him with blasphemy, Blasphemy is to speak offensively about God, and it says in the law of Moses, anyone who blasphemes the name of the Lord is to be put to death. The chief priest considered Jesus' claim to be the Messiah, the Son of God, to be blasphemy. And they would have been right if, if he wasn't actually the Messiah, the Son of God. So they brought Jesus before Pilate, who was the Roman governor of Judea. The Jews were under Roman law, and they did not have the authority to execute Jesus Jesus on their own. So they needed Pilate to convict him and condemn him to death. Interestingly, when they brought Jesus before Pilate, they restated the charges. It was not blasphemy that they accused Jesus of before Pilate, but rather they said Jesus claimed to be the king of the Jews. Blasphemy wouldn't warrant the death penalty under Roman law. But if Jesus claimed kingship, that would be a direct threat against the Roman emperor Tiberius Caesar. You see, the chief priests, they were not interested in justice. They just wanted to find a way to have Jesus executed. And I want us to hear Pilate's interaction with Jesus. Starting in verse 11, it says, Meanwhile, so while Judas was trying to return the 30 pieces of silver that he took for betraying Jesus and then hanging himself, while that was going on, Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? You have said so. Jesus replied. Jesus answers Pilate in the affirmative. He is. When he was accused by the chief priests and the elders, he gave no answer. Jesus just remained silent. He did not try to defend himself. Then Pilate asked him, don't you, he, don't you hear the testimony they are bringing against you? But Jesus made no reply, not even to a single charge, to the amazement of the governor. Pilate was amazed that Jesus did not defend himself, especially being that all the charges that were being brought before him were false. It reminds me of Isaiah 53, 7. It says, he was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep before its shears is silent, so he did not open his mouth. Now, it was the governor's custom at the festival to release a prisoner chosen by the crowd. At that time, they had a well-known prisoner whose name was Jesus Barabbas. 
So when the crowd had gathered, Pilate asked them, which, which one do you want me to release to you, Jesus Barabbas or Jesus who is called the Messiah? For he knew it was out of self-interest that they had handed Jesus over to him. At this point, Pilate found no grounds for the death penalty. Jesus was an innocent man. He committed no crime. But the, the Jewish leaders, they, they were not interested in justice. They had their own je- agenda. It was out of self-interest that they handed Jesus over to him. And just as a side note, you may notice that the NIV translation has Barabbas' name as Jesus Barabbas, while others just have it as Barabbas. This is because not all manuscripts have Jesus Barabbas in them, and so translator, translators decide if they use it or not. Either way, Pilate knew the chief priests were not concerned about Jesus being a threat to Rome. They were personally envious of his popularity and felt threatened by his authority. And so Pilate gave the crowd a choice. They could either have Jesus released or Barabbas. It was the governor's uh, custom to release a prisoner by the the choosing of the crowd during the Passover festival. And Pilate, he's hoping that the people will just choose Jesus so he can release them because he, he wasn't guilty of anything. He knew it. And, and I think in his mind, he wanted to offer the crowd an alternative to Jesus, one so morally reprehensible that they would have no choice but to choose Jesus. Which one do you want, he asks. Jesus? who is innocent, and not only that, when we look back at at Jesus' ministry, Jesus was for the people. He healed their diseases. He raised their dead. He cast out their demons. He fed them. He showed them love and compassion. He befriended the outcasts. He forgave them of of their sin. He was obedient to all the commands of God and, and taught them how to love God and love one another. And they were amazed. They were amazed at his teaching. Would the crowd choose Jesus or Barabbas? Were they so anti-Jesus that they would choose Barabbas? Barabbas, who was guilty, he he was a murderer. He didn't give life. He took life. He didn't obey the commands of God. He fought against them. And while Pilate waited for the crowd to make their decision, it says in verse 19, while Pilate was sitting on the judge's seat, his wife sent him this message. Now listen to this. She said, don't have anything to do with that innocent man, for I have suffered a great deal today in a dream because of him. Pilate's wife had a dream about Jesus. We're we're not told the contents of the dream, but only that it caused her to suffer. It was emotionally upsetting. And it made such an impression on her that she was willing to send word to her husband during the trial. The warning she received in the dream was that Jesus was an innocent man and Pilate should have nothing to do with his execution. Think for a moment. Who do you think sent her that warning in the dream? Satan? Or God. See, God testifies that his son is innocent. But it says the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and to have Jesus executed. Which of the two do you want me to release to you? asked the governor. Barabbas, they answered. What shall I do then with Jesus, who is called the Messiah? Pilate asked. They all answered, crucify him. Why? What crime has he committed? Asked Pilate, but they shouted all the louder, crucify him. Jesus had committed no crime. He was innocent. But truth was not their concern. When Pilate saw that they were getting nowhere, 
But that instead an uproar was starting, he took water and washed his hands in front of the crowd. I'm innocent of this man's blood, he said. It's your responsibility. All the people answered, his blood is on us and on our children. Wow. What a response. Now listen to this. Then he released Barabbas to them. But he had Jesus flogged, handed him over to be crucified. The guilty man was set free. While the innocent man was condemned to death. The guilty received what the innocent deserved. While the innocent received what the guilty deserved. So our question is, how are the guilty set free? And this is what I want all of us to know. Someone was going to the cross that day. Barabbas or Jesus? Barabbas was guilty, his deeds deserved death. Jesus, however, was innocent, his deeds did not deserve death. So Jesus was without sin. He didn't have a black card. The only one amongst us who didn't it says in 1 Peter 2.22, he committed no sin and no deceit was found in his mouth. He was morally perfect. He was completely obedient to God his Father and all his commands. Barabbas was set free. Why? Because Jesus took his place on the cross. And this was not a mere exchange sinner for sinner. This was a substitution, the righteous for the unrighteous. Jesus did not bear his sin on the cross. He had no sin to bear, but Jesus bore our sins in his body on the cross. He died in the place of sinners. He died for all of us who have a black card. How are the guilty set free? Jesus sets us free. Jesus sets us free. It says in John 8, 36, if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. Do you want to be set free from sin and death? Do you want to be set free from your guilt and your legal indebtedness? Then go to Jesus. For Jesus sets us free. It says in 2 Corinthians 5, 21, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. I want you to know that Jesus loves you. Jesus loves you. So much so that he gave his life for you on the cross. He, he is our substitute. There is no greater love than the love of Jesus. He died in the place of murderers, thieves, liars, cheats, gossips, adulterers, the sexually immoral, the hypocrites, the selfish, the arrogant, the unforgiving, the unbelieving, the haters. He died for his enemies. He died for his enemies. He died for you and I. The condemned the righteous for the unrighteous. He died so that we could go free. Now the question is, how does Jesus take our sin away? You know, how, do, how do we get rid of these cards? It's taken away through faith. It says in John 3, 18, whoever believes in Jesus is not condemned. You see, through, through faith, our, our black cards, our, our guilt, our sin, our legal indebtedness, it, it's taken away. But as it says, whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. For those who do not believe in Jesus, the, the guilt remains. They still carry their card. And if a person is still carrying their card, when they leave this world, whether at death or at Jesus' return, they will be punished for their sin for all eternity in the fires of hell. There's no, there's no second chance for redemption. 
after you've left this world. But the good news, the good news is that God has made a way for the guilty to be forgiven and for their sin to be taken away so they may be set free. If a person wants their sin to be taken away, they must first understand that they are a sinner. For all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. They must put their faith in Jesus Christ, believing that he is the Son of God and that he died on the cross for our sins, that he was buried, and that on the third day God raised him from the dead. They must repent of their sin, asking God to forgive them of all their sinful thoughts and actions, turning away from their sin, trusting only in Jesus for salvation. They must be want to be a disciple of Jesus and give their life fully over to him so he can lead them and teach them what it is to love others as he loved us. And for those who believe in Jesus, their sin will be forgiven. Their their sin will be taken away. There's, There's no more condemnation. For in Christ we are set free. But where does our sin go when we believe? Where do our black cards go? Colossians chapter 2, 14 tells us. We're going to put that up on the screen. This is what God has done for those who repent and believe. It says he forgave us of all our sins, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. His card is to represent your sin, your guilt, your legal indebtedness, the debt you owe God for breaking his law. And what this verse is saying is that when we repent and believe, God takes away our sin. He takes away our our legal indebtedness and he nails it to the cross. For it is on the cross where Jesus, it's on the cross that Jesus paid our debt. And if our sin has been nailed to the cross, we will never have to pay for it. For it's already been paid by Jesus Christ. Our our deeds deserve death, but in Christ we are forgiven, set free, and given God's gift of eternal life. My question is, how do we respond to such a great love? How do we respond to the love of Jesus? And what I want to do is give us an opportunity to respond to Jesus. I want to give us the opportunity to see our sin nailed to the cross. In a moment, I'm going to give you the chance to come up to the front and pin your black card to the cross. And this is to illustrate for us what Jesus has done on the cross. Jesus is the one who takes away our sin. He is the one who has paid our debt in full. And this is what we're gonna do. At the front, there's tables on my right and my left. On the table, uh, there are chalk and push pins. And if you choose to, I encourage you to come forward, write your name on your card with chalk, then take a pin, come over to the cross, and pin it to the cross. If you're taller, pin it up higher. If you're shorter, pin it a little lower. I want to make room for everyone. It's okay if the cards overlap. We're going to fill this cross. And if walking up to the front is just too much for you, maybe someone beside you can take your card up for you. There is no rush. We're going to take the time that we need. I want everyone who comes up just to, I want everyone to have an opportunity to come forward this morning. We can just form lines behind the tables. I want this to serve as a visual illustration of what spiritually takes place when a person repents of their sin and put their faith in Jesus Christ. And I'll say this, just because you pin your card to the cross does not make you 
a Christian. We only become a Christian when we believe in Jesus. That's something that takes place in your heart. But I want to encourage you, if you do not yet believe, take the time now to speak to Jesus. Confess your sin to him. Tell him that you believe in his death and resurrection. Tell him you want to follow him, and he will come into your life. He will set you free, and you will have eternal life. If you're a follower of Christ, take the time to reflect on the great love Jesus has for you. Thank him for dying for you, for giving you life, for forgiving you, for setting you free. If you have unconfessed sin in your life, ask him to forgive you of your sin. He's faithful to do so. If you've been distant from Jesus, maybe maybe this is the time you speak to him and recommit your life to Christ. Maybe it's time for you to be baptized and publicly declare that you're a follower of Jesus Christ. Maybe this morning is the, the morning that you make that decision. Maybe it's time to make being a disciple of Christ a priority, committing to Christ. Or maybe you can take this time just to speak to the Lord and ask him to teach you how to, to love, P- Peter, or sorry, love people in a greater way. Jesus said, this is my command. Love one another as I have loved you. We, we all need to grow in our love for one another. My encouragement to you is this. Come to the cross and spend time with Jesus. Pastor Scott and Stephanie are going to come in a moment and quietly play the song, Jesus Paid It All. Once the music begins and you're ready, please come forward, write your name on your card, come to the front, and pin it to the cross. Feel free to sing along or just quietly reflect and listen to what the Lord is saying to you this morning. And before we respond to Jesus and his great love, let me just lead us in prayer. Heavenly Father, you are compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in love. We praise you and thank you, for you have not treated us as our sins deserve, but instead you sent your son Jesus, who died in our place, in the place of sinners, so that we may be set free and forgiven of our rebellion against you. He took up our pain and bore our suffering. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace with God was on him. And by his wounds we are healed. In these moments, Lord, we ask that you pour out your spirit upon us. Open our hearts to the good news of Jesus so that we may receive him. Give us the words so that we may respond in faith to the love of Jesus. And forgive us, Lord, of all our sins. And teach us how to love one another. Jesus, we come to you now, laying our lives before you at the cross. Deliver us, Lord. Deliver us from the evil one. In Jesus' name, amen. I hear the Savior say, Thy strength 
indeed is small. Child of weakness, watch and pray. Find in me thine all in all. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he who washed it white as snow. Thy power and thine alone can change the leper spots and melt the heart of stone. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin a crimson stain he washed it white as snow and when before the throne I stand in him complete Jesus died my soul to save my lips shall still repeat jesus paid it all all to him i owe sin had left a crimson stain he washed it white as snow Oh, praise the one who paid my debt and raised this life up from the dead. Oh, praise the one who paid my debt and raised this life up from the dead. Oh, praise the one who paid my debt and raised this life up from the dead oh praise the one who paid my debt and raised this life up from the dead jesus paid it all all to him i owe sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow.
washed us clean in the blood of Jesus. We didn't deserve that. And yet you did it. You set the guilty free. Hallelujah. Amen. You may be seated. Oh, praise the one who paid my debt and raised this life up from the dead. Jesus paid it all. If you put your faith in Jesus Christ today, please come share your decision with me or Pastor Jason, Pastor Scott. We want to celebrate with you. You've been set free, forgiven, and given eternal life. If you've decided to be baptized, please come speak to me or one of the other pastors, we want to help prepare you for your baptism and celebrate with you. May this cross be a visual reminder for us of the great love of Jesus Christ. The cross is where the righteous died for the unrighteous. It's where the guilty are forgiven and set free. See. God has taken away our black cards. He's taken away our sin, nailing them to the cross, and we bear it no more. We are free in Christ. Someone was going to the cross that day. Barabbas or Jesus. I'm eternally grateful that it was Jesus. I really don't have the words to express my gratitude. I'm not worthy of Christ. But I thank you, Jesus, for taking my place. My life is his. Pastor Jason's gonna come and lead us in communion now. 